The Moon Over the Mountain, by Nakashima Ashishi. Li Chen of Longxi was a very talented and learned young man who, in the last year of the Tianbao era, seven fifty-five, passed the qualifying examination to become a government official. He was put in charge of the constabulary and military affair in the area south of the lower reaches of the Yangtze River, but. Strong-willed and self-confident, Li Chang could not rest content with his status as a low-ranking official. He soon resigned his office, retiring to his native Guolu, where he cut off all contact with anyone outside his family and devoted his life to writing poetry. He preferred to leave a name as a poet that might last a hundred years after his death to serving as a minor official who had continually to bend the knee before vulgar superiors. But literary fame, he found, was not so easy to gain, and day by day his personal situation became more precarious. Gradually, he grew irritable; his face took on a harsh cruelty, and his body grew emaciated. His eyes had a strange glitter. There was no trace of the handsome, rosy-cheeked youth who had passed the rigorous official examination. After a few years, unable to bear his poverty, Li Chang bent his principle in order to provide food and clothing for his wife and children, and set off again for the east, where he accepted employment as a local official. He did this in part too because he had all but despaired of succeeding as a poet. By this time, his former classmate has long since climbed the high position. And Li Cheng's self-esteem was severely wounded by having to take orders from men he had deemed dull when he himself has been so promising. A melancholy overtook him, and he grew increasingly unable to suppress a half-mad egotism. After a year under these circumstances, Li Cheng set out on official business, and having taken lodging on the banks of a river, he at last went mad. Late one night, he rose from his bed with an uncanny look on his face and rushed out of the inn, shouting unintelligible gibberish as he plunged into the darkness. He never returned, nor did searches of the nearby mountains and moors offer any clue to his whereabouts. No one knew what had become of Li Chang. The following year, the imperial inspector Yuan Kan of Chenzhen received an imperial command to travel to Lingnan. Along the way, he stopped at Shangyu. Before dawn the next day, as he was preparing to set out, the man in charge of the official lodgings warned him about the man-eating tiger on the road ahead. One could proceed with safety only in broad daylight, since it was still so early. It would be preferable to wait until the break of the day, he said. Yuan Kan, however, trusting in the size of his retinue, ignored this advice and set out. By what little remained of the moonlight, they made their way through a grassy area of a forest. When suddenly, out from the thicket, left a tiger. The tiger appeared ready to attack Yuan Kan when it abruptly turned around and retreated. A human voice could now be heard from the thicket, muttering over and over, "That was a very near thing." It was a voice that Yuan Kan had heard before. In the midst of his shock and fear, he remembered whose voice it was. Why, it's my old friend, Master Li Chang," he cried out. Yuan Kan has passed the official examinations in the same year as Li Chang, and had been one of his very few close friends. Perhaps because Yuan Kan's warm and amiable personality had never clashed with Li Chang's more extreme nature. At first, there was no response from the thicket, just occasional faint sounds as of someone weeping. After a time, a low voice replied. Indeed, I am Li Cheng of Longxi. Yuan Kan forgot all fear and, dismounting from his horse, approached the thicket, wishing to greet his old friend, whom he had not met for so many years. But why would Li Cheng not emerge and show himself? He asked. Li Cheng's voice answered that he was no longer in human form. How could he shamelessly expose himself in his degradation to his old friend? For if he did. His friend would surely feel nothing but fear and loathing. Still, having encountered Yuan Kan by chance like this, he could almost forget his shame in the joy of seeing him. Could you somehow overlook my hideous state and talk with me for a while as your former friend Li Chang? Although it seemed odd when he later recalled this moment, Yuan Kan was able to accept the fact of this supernatural wonder very calmly, without doubt. 
He ordered his subordinate to stop the mounted party, and he stood by the thicket, conversing with the voice of the person unseen. The gossip of the capital, news of old acquaintances, Yuan Kang's current position, and Li Sheng's word of congratulation on it. After speaking of all these things in the familiar manner of men who had known each other from their youth, Yuan Kang asked Li Sheng how he had come to this present state. This is what the voice said. I was traveling about a year ago when I stopped for the night at an inn on the banks of the Wu River. I slept for a while, then suddenly awakened to hear my name being called. I went outdoors into the darkness, the voice repeatedly calling to me. I found myself running in pursuit of the voice. Furiously, I ran and ran. The road entered a mountain wood, and before long, I found myself grasping at the earth with both hands as I ran. I felt an unaccountable sense of power filling my body as I left lightly over the rocks. I noticed that fur was beginning to sprout on my hands and elbows. After daybreak, I looked into a stream to see my reflection and discovered that I had become a tiger. At first, I could not believe my eyes. Then I thought it must be a dream. After all, I had experience of dreams in which, while dreaming, I knew that was a dream. When at last I had to acknowledge that this was no dream, I was stunned. And then afraid, so then the very strangest thing can happen. I thought and was deeply afraid. But why had this happened? I had no idea. We understand nothing. It seems things are pressed upon us, and we must patiently accept them. Without understanding, we must go on living without knowing why. It is our fate as creatures. At once, I thought of death. But at that moment, a rabbit ran before me, and in an instant, the human within me disappeared. When it reappeared, I awoke to find my mouth smeared with blood and rabbit fur scattered around me. That was my first experience as a tiger, and as for what I have continued to do from then until the present, I cannot bear to say. Yet for a few hours each day, my human consciousness returns, and then, as in former days, I can use human speech and think complex thoughts, and even recite passages from the Confucian classics. When, with my human consciousness, I see the results of my savagery as a tiger and reflect upon my fate, I feel misery, fear, and anger. But with the time, those few hours of human consciousness are growing fewer and fewer. For a while, I often wondered why I had turned into a tiger. But the other day, I found myself wondering why I had once been a human being. What a terrible thing that is! Soon, the human consciousness that I still have will vanish. Buried beneath the ways of a beast, like the foundations of an ancient palace, gradually being buried beneath the sands. When that happens, I will lose my past entirely and wander about as a raging tiger. And if I should happen to encounter you along the way, I would not recognize you as an old friend, but tear you to pieces and devour you without a moment's regret. Actually, all beasts and men were originally something else. I am sure. At first, they remember what they were. Then gradually, they forget, convinced that their present shape was not ever any different. But never mind about that. If the human consciousness within me were to completely disappear, I would probably be happier than I am now. Yet the human being within fears that more than anything else. How very frightening, sad, and painful that outcome seems. That I would lose all memories of having been human. How can others understand how I feel? They cannot, unless they have experienced the very same thing. But wait, I have a favor to ask of you before I cease entirely to be human. Yuan Kan and his party listened with bated breath to the extraordinary things the voice from the thicket was saying. It went on. My sole aim in life was to win fame as a poet, but my goal has gone unachieved, and I have come to this. The several hundred poems that I wrote are unknown to the world. I doubt that anyone could even find the paper they were written on. But there are many poems that I can recite from memory, and I beg of you, please write them down and make them known. It is not that I would fancy myself a proper poet if you were to do so. No, whether the poems are good or bad, I would not rest easy on my grave without passing these poems on to later generations, since they represent the deepest passion in life. Even to the point of losing my fortune and my sanity, Yuan Kang ordered one of his subordinates to take up a brush and write down what the voice from the thicket recited. Li Cheng's voice rang out clearly. He recited thirty long and short poems, elegant in expression and lofty in sentiment, 
all demonstrating, even upon first hearing, the poet's uncommon ability. Yet Yuan Khan, although deeply impressed, could not overcome a vague unease. There could be no question that the poet's talents were first rate, but there was a subtle lack that kept the poems from achieving the highest quality. Li Cheng, having finished his recitation of old poems, suddenly turned to mocking himself. It is shameful to admit, but even now that I have sunk to such degraded state, I still sometimes dream that a volume of my poems rests on the reading desk of the cultivated gentleman of Chang'an. That is what I dream as I lie in my mountain cave. Is that not ridiculous? The spectacle of a man who failed to become a poet and become a tiger instead? Yuan Khan recalled the youthful Li Cheng's penchant for self-mockery and listened with a heavy heart. Well, continued Li Cheng, shall I add to the fun by composing an extemporaneous poem, expressing my present feelings, just to prove that the old Li Cheng is still alive somewhere inside his tiger? May I? Yuan Khan again ordered his subordinate to take down the poem, which went as follows. Having chanced to go mad, I became a wild beast. Calamity piled upon calamity, I cannot escape my fate. Who could now withstand my fangs and claws? Yet in student days, I shared your bright promise. Now I have become a beast crouching in a thicket, while you ride grandly in an official carriage. Tonight, I gaze at the bright moon over the mountain, unable to sing an ode. I can only howl. By then, the light of the moon had grown faint, and white dew covered the ground. The chill wind that blew among the trees told the party that dawn was near. Everyone present, forgetting the strangeness of the tale, joined in respectfully, lamenting the poet's misfortunes. Li Cheng's voice went on. I said a moment ago that I did not know why I met this fate. But when I think carefully about it, I have in fact some idea why. When I was a man, I did my best to avoid contact with others. People thought me arrogant and self-important. They did not realize it was rather shyness that made me act that way. Of course, I was not without pride in my old reputation as a prodigy among the boys of my hometown. It was a timid kind of pride. I hoped to make a name for myself as a poet. But I never attached myself to a teacher or sought out the company of other poets who might have helped me to improve my skill. At the same time, I had no intention of ranking myself together with the common, unpoetic herd. But this was the result of my timid pride and a disdainful shyness. Fearing that I might not be a jewel, I made no effort to polish myself. But half believing that I might be a jewel, I could not rest content among the common clay. Little by little, I grew apart from the world and distant from others. I fed my cowardly self-respect with doublets of rage, shame, and self-pity. We are all of us trainers of wild beasts, it is said, and the beasts in question are our own inner selves. In my case, the beast inside was my self-important sense of shame. That was my tiger, and it damaged me, brought sorrow to my wife and children, wounded my friends, and in the end changed my outward form into this animal that befits my inward state. I realize now I wasted what little real talent I had. With my lips, I repeated the old saw that life is far too long to do nothing, but far too short to do something of value. But all there was in me was a coward fear that my lack of talent might be revealed. And a lazy hatred for taking the pains needed to nurture it. There are very many men with talent far weaker than mine who have become splendid poets because they devoted themselves to polishing and improving what they had. Now that I have turned into a tiger, I've realized that at last, and it fills me with burning regret. I can no longer live as a human being. Even if I could compose in my mind the most wonderful poem, how could it ever be published? And my mind itself is becoming more like a tiger's with each passing day. What shall I do with my wasted past? When the pain is too great to bear, I climb up to the crag at the top of the mountain and howl into the empty valleys. I want my burning sorrow to be known. Last night, I howled at the moon from that same spot, hoping that someone might somehow understand. But the animals, when they heard my voice, crouched on the ground in fear. And the mountains, trees, moons, and the dew know only that a tiger has gone mad and is roaring in his rage. I could leap up to the heavens or throw myself to the ground, lamenting. Yet there is none who understands what I feel, just as there was none who understood my vulnerable heart when I was a human being.
If my fur looks wet, it is not only with the night dew. At last, the surrounding darkness began to fade. From beyond the trees came the mournful sound of a horn announcing the dawn. And now we must say farewell, since the time of my madness, the time when I must return to my tiger state, is near," said Li Chang's voice. But I have yet another favor to beg before we part. It concerns my wife and children still in Guola. Of course, they know nothing of my fate. After you return from the south, could you tell them that I have died? I do not want them to know anything of what has happened between us today. And although it is presumptuous of me, I beg you, have pity on their abandoned state and do what you can so they do not die of cold and hunger by some roadside. It would be a debt of gratitude I can never hope to repay. Li Sheng having spoken these words, a loud cry came from within the thicket. Yuan Kang was in tears as he assured his old friend that he would do what was asked, but Li Sheng's voice resumed a tone of self-mockery. Were I human in the least, I would have begged this favor before anything else. A man who is more concerned about his wretched poetry than about his wife and children deserves the face of becoming a tiger. Li Sheng then warned Yuan Kang that when he made the return journey from Lingnan, he must take care not to come this way. By then, Li Cheng's madness would have returned, and unable to recognize his old friend, he might well attack him. Finally, Li Cheng asked Yuan Kan that when he reached the top of the hill a hundred paces ahead, he looked back in this direction. Li Cheng wished to show him his present form once more. It was not to impress Yuan Kan with his power, but rather by showing him the hideous beast he had become, to ensure that Yuan Kan would have no desire to pass this way in order to meet him again. Yuan Kan turned toward the thicket and said heartfelt words of farewell, then mounted his horse. Once again, the sound of a human weeping uncontrollably was heard. Yuan Kan too wept as he rode away, glancing back several times. When the group of travelers reached the top of the hill, they turned to look back at the grassy place in the grove. They saw a tiger spring out from the thick grass and onto the road. The tiger gazed at the moon, already pale, having lost its brilliance, and roared mightily two times, three times, then leapt back into the brush. They never saw the tiger again. Translated by Paul McCarthy.